you can reboot those also. Okay. Hello, welcome everybody. I'm just going to give everyone a couple of minutes to join. For those of you just joining for the first time, my name is Shiri Orion. I'm the executive director of the American Friends of the Parent Circle. And I want to thank you for joining us today on very what is turning out to be a very difficult day, a very difficult week. We've had an overwhelming response today to this webinar, and so I'm just giving people time to, to join us, and then we'll get started. For those of you just joining us, welcome. My name is Shiri Orion. I'm the Executive Director of the American Friends of the Parent Circle. Um, the American Friends of the Parent Circle is an American nonprofit of 501c3. On our mission is to raise awareness and funds for the incredible work of the Parent Circle Families Forum, um, an organization made up of more than 600 bereaved families, Israelis and Palestinians, all of them have lost a loved one um, to the conflict, and all of them have chosen this unique path of reconciliation rather than revenge. And they use their stories, they share their stories with Israelis and Palestinians and people all over the world in order to promote hope and to promote nonviolence and an alternative to um, the terrible violence that we are seeing today. Um, I wanna take a moment because originally this webinar was supposed to be and still very much is to commemorate the Nakba day, which is on May 15th. Um, we did not know then what would be happening when we organize this webinar, what would be taking place today. And we must take a minute to acknowledge and, and share our deepest concern and sympathy for the terrible crisis that's happening in Jerusalem, for the violence that has ensued ever since in both Gaza and, and now in Tel Aviv and in Southern Israel. Um, we have people who are here with us today from Israel and the West Bank who are living through this very scary time. Um, as we started we are hearing reports from our members who are um, in the Tel Aviv area, who are in their shelters. Um, and this is uh, one of our panelists, um, Yuval Rachamim, who's the co-director, the Israeli co-director of the Parent Circle was supposed to join us. He is in his um, shelter and cannot join us yet. Maybe he'll be able to join us later. Um, so I, I really wanted to acknowledge that. We even debated whether this was appropriate and you know, it's it's so appropriate that we continue with this webinar because the the Nakba continues. Mm -hmm. The impact of our history continues and, and, and we see it today. And and I think that that makes it even more important for the parent circle and for our messages of reconciliation and hope to be heard on a day like today. So I really appreciate all of you being here. Um, I want to introduce some, some important people to you. Um, first, we have Umar Al-Ubari, and he's joining us from Neve Shalom in Israel. And Umar, we spoke earlier, and he was hearing sirens, um, not for his specific area, but that might happen, and Umar will have to um, leave us. But for now, Umar, thank you for being here with us, and we're glad you are safe. Um, Umar is going to be our tour guide today. He's going to take us on a tour of the village of Lipta, which was a former Palestinian village um, until all the residents were expelled and the town was depopulated. And the reason that um, you know Lipta is so important is because it shows us the national narrative, it shows us a historical narrative, Palestinian national and historical narrative. Um, and shows us also the national trauma. And that's something that is very important for us at Parent Circle to do. 
we show the national trauma of both sides, not to compare the suffering, not to compare the Nakba and the Holocaust, um, but, but so that we can each understand each other's psyches, so that we can understand the Israeli psyche and we can understand the Palestinian psyche. Without understanding each other's national traumas, we will not be able um, to understand even what's happening right as we speak in this moment. Um, we have with us As Asad Mahmoud Abu Asad. Thank you, Asad, for joining us here from the West Bank. Asad participated in our narrative program, which takes participants to LIFTA and, and uh, explores the narrative um, of Israelis and Palestinians with, um, together. Um, he was in the first group that we did this way, with way back in 2012. Um, he lives in the village of Idna, um, outside of Hebron, Hebron in the West Bank. And we have Naomi, Naomi Gerstein here with us today. Thanks for joining us. She participated in one of our narrative projects um, from 2018 to 2019. Um, it was part of a cohort of participants who are parents of teenagers. So all of the Israeli and all of the Palestinian participants um, were uh, parents of teenagers. So they have some sort right. of common connection. And Asad and Naomi will tell us a little bit more about their experience, both in the narrative project and in LIFTA um, a little bit later. Um, we'll also have Yuval here, I hope. Um, I hope he'll be able to join us in a little while. Um, we're going to take about a 20 minute tour of LIFTA and then we'll open it up to questions and answers. We'll hear from Naomi and Asad. If you have questions and answers, I see that people are already active in the chat. I ask you please to put your questions. If you look at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A box. It says Q&A. Please put your questions in there and I will do my best to get to all of them. We have a lot of people here today. Um, and so I, you know, we'll, we'll do our best to get to all of them. So I, I'm gonna stop speaking. I think um, Umar, this wasn't exactly planned, but I think it was, it's important for if you could just spend a minute or two before we go to do the tour, um, talking about the connection between you know, what is going on today in Sheikh Jarrah and Jerusalem, um, and then the violence that has taken place ever since and the tour that we're about to take. Okay, good evening. Thank you very much for organizing this. Um, thank you for inviting me. Just to clarify, I'm, I'm not part of the circle, parent circles. I'm just invited as a, um, an expert of the, on the Nakba issues and uh, uh, as a guide in the destroyed Palestinian uh, localities inside the state of Israel that Lifta, the village that we are going to learn about, is one of them. Um, when we try to learn the, the, the meaning of the Nakba, or the, the, the real meaning and the deep meaning of the Nakba, uh, as researchers, as people who are aware of what happened and what's happening in these days, um, we already um, um, define that as ongoing Nakba. Nakba is not a historical event that happened in 1948 and it stopped there. Uh, the, the effects, the impacts, and even the same practices that caused the Nakba are still in, in use um, uh, by the Israeli government and the Israeli uh, uh, state towards Palestinian communities in different places. And the other meaning why it is ongoing, it is because the file of the Nakba and the injustice that happened to the Palestinian people in 1948 still not redressed, not corrected, not closed. And we believe that till the time that the justice will be done to the Palestinian people and the injustice will be redressed, then we can say we close the file of the Nakba. And what is uh, going since 1948 till today in the relationship between Israel and the Palestinian people in different places is part of the ongoing Nakba, preventing the return of the Palestinian refugees that forcibly had to leave their places and homes and towns, uh, um, um, preventing them to, to return to their homes by a clear decision of the Israeli government in June 1948, still actual till today, still relevant till, till today. 
And part of these uh, refugees are living in the areas that under the direct control of the state of Israel, part of them inside Israel as citizens of the state of Israel. And even those had been prevented to return to their original places, even they are citizens of the state of Israel. And some of them living in East Jerusalem that had been occupied in 1967 and living as a residents of the city of Jerusalem. Some of those families living in the neighborhood of Sheikh Jarrah. The case that we uh, uh, hear about it in these days, the families of uh, Sheikh Jarrah who became without their own decision uh, as a result of the war of 1948, as a result of the decision of the Jordanian government, uh, um, become part of this neighborhood, living in a houses or in a land that had been given by the Jordanian uh, uh, government till the situation of them will be resolved, which means as refugees who had been expelled from Jaffa, from Haifa, from West Jerusalem, all these families that we are now facing their case uh, are under threat of to be expelled for the second or the third time from the current houses. Uh, uh, all of them are actually refugees since 1948. So it's still the, the issue of 1948, the issue of the Nakba uh, uh, running with them all these times and of course in these, in these days. Um, of course, the excuse, if you, are, if you follow this story, the excuse of the Israeli government is ridiculous because uh, they will allow uh, uh, Jewish families, even not the families, Jewish side, to take back their property that they had before 1948, but not allowing at the same time the Palestinians who had property at the same time to take it back. And this is the conflict and the issue in the um, in the uh, neighborhood of Sheikh, of Sheikh Jarrah. Sheikh Jarrah will be part of the, uh, the city of Jerusalem and the mosque of Al-Aqsa is in the heart of the, uh, of the city. And um, it's, the, it's, 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 it's real, it's real uh, hot point, but it's symbolic hot point also. It's, it symbolized the whole story and we will be concentrated in that, uh, in that area uh, uh, to have the really to, to squeeze the the the, the complication uh, of the situation uh, in Palestine uh, with Israel, and to see that that point uh, as something if will not be resolved, nothing seems to be resolved. It's it, it will start from from there. It will start from the acknowledgement. Uh, of the state of Israel uh, on the return of the Palestinian refugees, acknowledgement on the Nakba, which means responsibility for what happened to the Palestinian people in 1948, and to be part of the of making the justice uh, for all the people who suppose and can live in this landscape, uh, um, regardless their religion or their nationality. Uh, I hope this once we 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 will be busy with how to build and to create the new situation and do and the real equality and real democracy in this in this country. Um, so yes, this is how I see the whole is connected. And of course now uh, um, Gaza is Gaza is in, involved in the in the current story and Gaza is under attack and the missiles from Gaza uh, uh, attacking in, in the Israeli side. And uh, I do remember with that bad situation that the majority of the, of the Palestinians in Gaza are also refugees that had been expelled in 1948 as a result of the Nakba. So all over we look around, the Nakba is still there. And acknowledgement of the Nakba is, is very important in order to, to understand the conditions and the situation that we live in these days, not only to learn about the history. Thank you, Omar. I think that that was very helpful. And I, I think that we'll, we'll now take our, our uh, participants now to Lifta. Um, I see that the, the picture behind you is a picture of Lifta. So this will give people exactly, a, a yeah. good glance. 
of what we're going to see. And then when we come back, uh, Umar will be here to ask questions. So I think we're ready to travel. Now we are in the entrance of the area that became the famous Lifta. We are going to walk down to see the uh, uh, center of the village and the oldest part of the village. In fact, the village of Lifta was much wider than the area that we are going to visit. All this uh, uh, area around us is part of Lifta. The Israeli Jewish neighborhood called Romema is located on the upper part of Lifta, one of the neighborhoods of the village. Even some of the original Palestinian houses are still located among the high buildings over there. And in the corner, we can see a uh, part of the Palestinian school of Lifta that was built in 1929 and uh, became, after 1948, uh, a Jewish Orthodox school called Talmud Torah. Now we are starting to walk towards the center of the village of Lifta that we are going to show you in order to understand what happened to the village after 1948 during the Nakba that we are going to learn about. Nakba is a word in Arabic means catastrophe or big disaster. This is the term that we use in order to describe the events that happened to the Palestinian people since the end of 1947, mainly in 1948, and in some uh, in meanings we still use this term to, uh, uh, to describe the ongoing Nakba till today. The understanding of the deep meaning of the Nakba needs to uh, expose what happened in the uh, modern history of the, uh, uh, in Palestine during the uh, uh, British mandate and uh, uh, around the establishment of the state of Israel. We talk about the, 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 the forcibly expulsion of about 750,000 Palestinians from the area that became the, the state of Israel. What was inside the Green Line is a, a big population of Palestinian people, about 900,000, 750,000 and even more had been uh, expelled uh, forcibly from their villages, towns, cities and homeland. After the expulsion, the state of Israel will confiscate their property will capture their houses and their lands. Later on, during the coming years, after 1948, it will destroy the, uh, 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 the, the, the houses. It's most of the cases, it bulldozed the, uh, uh, the buildings and the houses. Uh, um, not less than 600 Palestinian cities, towns, and villages had been destroyed and erased from the landscape. The next stage of the, uh, of the Nakba is to uh, Judaize or Israelize the whole area that the State of Israel had uh, uh, captured and use that for the state or for the new population, Jewish population that will come and uh, live in these, in these areas. Most of the names in Arabic had been switched to Hebrew uh, Hebrew names, most of the names had been taken from the old Jewish history or from the modern Zionist history or just to translate that from Arabic to Hebrew. So all these stages, all these steps, we uh, uh, understand as a part of the Nakba that's still ongoing till today. And uh, to, to frame that in one decision, which is the most crucial decision to maintain the Palestinian refugees uh, 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 situation or status, the decision of the government of Israel in June 1948 about the Palestinian refugees. The government had a very serious discussion and officially they decided not to allow the Palestinian refugees to come back. And they gave orders to the soldiers on the lines to uh, uh, stop or to prevent any attempt of return of Palestinian families. And thousands of Palestinians had been killed just because they tried to step back 
to their homes and to their uh, villages. The division gave the Jewish minority in Palestine, which was 600,000 people, 54% of the, of the area. Uh, in the time that the Palestinians, who were about 1 million point four, uh, got 44% uh, of, the, of the area. Uh, and 1% in this place that we are standing at was uh, offered as international zone uh, because of the holy uh, uh, cities, the holy uh, sites of Jerusalem and Beit Lahem, uh, supposed to be uh, international zone. Especially when David Ben-Gurion and the Zionist movement said that we accept the partition plan, but we have some notes. Uh, to say about. One of them is not, uh, uh, it doesn't make sense for them that Jerusalem is not part of the Jewish state. So they used actually the rejection of the Palestinian people in order to occupy and to capture uh, 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 more land that the partition plan gave. What is interesting to understand in this process that at least 40% of the Palestinian people were expelled and 40% of the Palestinian localities, cities and villages, were captured before the declaration of the State of Israel that was in May 14th, which means under the eyes of the British government, under the eyes of the British mandate. What also it means that it was before the start of the formal war between Israel and the Arab armies that started formally in May 15th. So the expulsion was not as a reaction or, or, or as a result of the war, but it was already a systematic process that started in the end of 1947 against the Palestinian civilians and villages before the Arab armies took part in this war. One of the Zionist organizations called the Lehi attacked uh, a coffee shop that was owned by a family from Lifta in the uh, area that we see over there, in what is called Rumema, uh, um, beyond these high buildings, uh, they attacked the coffee shop and murdered uh, six people and wounded other seven uh, uh, people. All of them were from the village of Lifta. So this attack on December 1947 actually sent a very strong message to the people of Lifta Lifta in the, uh, in the end of 1947 was one of the biggest villages in the area of Jerusalem. Uh, the number of the population was about 3,000 people. Uh, they had about 600 houses. They had a wide land, about 10,000 dunams that they cultivated for many generations. So the first attack that caused the families that live in the upper part of the village to go down to live for a while in the houses of their relatives and friends. They thought, of course, that this is just a, a part of time or a few weeks and the tension will end and the people will go back to their normal life. They were wrong, as we will soon understand, because the, uh, uh, the same organization came two weeks after that, in the beginning of January 1948, and blew up the empty houses of the upper, of the upper neighborhood in the area that we see in front. The people of Lifta says that the young men are still in the, uh, in the village. They thought that they can protect their homes and their, uh, their lands. But the fear and the uh, attacks on the village uh, every week almost, as I said, caused the gradually uh, uh, expulsion of more and more families. And uh, what happened in the beginning of April, exactly in April 9th, the attack on the neighboring village of Der Yassin, which is in the other side of the street. Der Yassin was attacked on April 9th, and uh, uh, the attack was very, very terrible. Uh, uh, during the, uh, uh, the occupation of the village and capturing the houses, the attackers, mainly from the uh, ATL organization, but with the support of the Haganah also, 
uh, massacred more than 115 people and uh, 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 captured the village within 12 hours and the village actually disappeared. Uh, um, uh, so Der Yassin was occupied and massacred in that uh, day and the news from Der Yassin came very fast to the neighboring villages and the other areas in Jerusalem and in Palestine in general and uh, uh, it caused a lot of, of, of terror and fear among the Palestinian families. So the first families to feel the fear and to, uh, 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 to hear what happened in Der Yassin were the, pe the people who still uh, in Lifta and when they felt that some troops are coming towards the village they said as they told me in their testimonies we will not wait for our massacre so we can say that the last day that any Palestinian family uh, or person lived in Lifta was April 9th and since that time no one of them was allowed to come back and to return uh, to the village and they wanted to return very soon after the war ended they wanted to come back to their villages and homes but as i said before the decision of the state of israel was very clear not to allow the refugees to come back so 3,000 people at that time uh, moving to uh, 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 look for a new safer places to live in some of them in the refugee camps in the area of ramallah few families went to their own land in East Jerusalem, what became East Jerusalem, and they had been occupied in 1967 again. Uh, uh, during the years, many of them moved to Jordan, living in Amman uh, today. So we can say that the 3,000 people in 1948 became a big community with their descendants, around 40,000 people living around the world, mainly in the West Bank and, and Jordan. Now we are in the center of the old part of Lifta. We are uh, very close to the um, uh, water spring, which is one of the famous sites of the village of Lifta, was located in the center of the village. It seems that the village was built actually around uh, the natural water uh, spring. In the memory of the uh, Palestinian refugees, this area was one of the most important area in their lives. They drank water, they, they used the water for the uh, houses, for the agriculture, for the gardens uh, around their, uh, their houses. But it also was kind of social center that the people gathered around uh, the, uh, the spring. Uh, many uh, ceremonies, many parties, many wedding parties took place around the spring. Immediately after the expulsion of the Palestinian families in 1948, the Israeli government uh, gave these houses in the beginning of 1950 to Jewish families, mainly families who immigrated to Israel from Arab countries, from Middle East countries. And all these houses were populated by Jewish families for almost 20 years, between 1950 to 1970. The purpose of giving uh, the Palestinian houses for Jewish families actually uh, uh, was used by the Israeli government uh, in different ways. Uh, one goal was to protect the country, especially when the village is located very close to the Green Line and it might be some of the Palestinian refugees living or standing or waiting in the other side of the line of the border which is very close it's about just a few hundred meters from here uh, so jewish families using these houses living in the village will prevent their return actually to their own houses the other goal will be giving housing for the uh, big number of jewish families that immigrated to israel in the uh, first years of the country and the government did not build yet enough neighborhoods, enough houses for all these families. So we can see Lifta as one example of using the Palestinian houses for housing the Jewish families, for 
period of time. And when the Jewish families moved uh, out of the village, the uh, houses became empty. In 95% of the other Palestinian villages, the government will destroy the Palestinian houses totally. But here in Lifta, we have a special case uh, that most of the houses are still standing. Uh, they are not in use. They are partly destroyed, but they are still standing. Actually, uh, it could be also kind of mistake by the government of Israel, because if you want to understand the trauma and the loss of the Palestinian community in Lifta, it's enough just to look at these houses and to see uh, what the Palestinian refugees uh, lost and how and what they feel when they see the, these houses or uh, remember uh, uh, these houses. The Israeli authorities did have a plan uh, 10 years ago to build a new Israeli neighborhood here in Lifta uh, with Hebrew name, Main Iftoach. These houses supposed to be, according to this plan of the new neighborhood, to be destroyed, most of them, except maybe one or two buildings as a symbolic uh, uh, site uh, for the old village. The plan was published, I think, eight years ago, and immediately a very uh, big number of uh, NGOs, international NGOs, Israeli NGOs, uh, some activists, architects, and of course the refugees of Lifta uh, gathered together in a campaign that they called it Save Lifta in order to stop the plan of the Israeli authorities to destroy the village and to build a new Israeli neighborhood. Fortunately, I can say that the campaign had some success. The, the map uh, for this moment is frozen. The plan of the authorities did not start. We hope that they will uh, cancel the plan totally. Now we are in the uh, house that uh, belonged to Mr. Khalil Omar, who was one of the Mukhtars, one of the leaders of the village of Lifta till 1948. We can see that this flat is a very modern one. I think this is the most modern flat in the Palestinian village of Lifta. It was built in the 1940s. This house was used in the 20 years that Jewish families lived in the village of Lifta as a school for the Jewish kids between 1950 to 1970. According to the Israeli law, after the evacuation of the Jewish families in 1970 or late 60s and 70s, uh, these houses became uh, 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 part of the public space, public park. So no one is allowed uh, to use these uh, houses. So what is going on if you see people living in these houses or staying for a while in these houses, they are doing that illegally. Uh, many graffiti in the village of Lifta around us and the walls of the, uh, of the houses. Some of them are new graffiti. Two weeks ago I was here, I didn't see these uh, graffitis over here. So it seems uh, that uh, people coming all the time to this area and uh, uh, making uh, some activities, as I said, some of them for good purposes and some graffiti uh, will be for ugly and racist uh, purposes like that one in green that says Mavit Larvim, death to Arabs. Now we are in the mosque of Lifta. This was the garden of the mosque, this is the uh, entrance. And this side uh, used to be the wash corner and the toilet. And this side we can see the stairs leading to the top of the roof. It seems that this building will be the oldest building that we find in, uh, in Lifta. So this is the central hall of the mosque. Uh, this is the place that people used to pray in. And uh, in, in the front, in this wall, you can see that niche in the center, which is actually the direction uh, to Mecca. If you look at the building, you can see very simple stones and mud uh, that the whole building was built with. It's very sad to see these conditions in a holy place. You can see some graffiti on the walls that's not related 
uh, to the mosque. Unfortunately, it's not surprising me when you deal with the stories of the Nakba and you look at the ruins of the destroyed Palestinian villages around the, uh, uh, the state of Israel, you will see dozens of mosques in this situation if they are still standing. Uh, by the way, hundreds of mosques were destroyed when the hundreds of Palestinian villages were destroyed, also the mosques were taken uh, with, the, uh, with the houses. By the way, there are some churches also were destroyed or abandoned or uh, erased or uh, converted to something uh, uh, different. It's not only the mosques in these conditions, but also the uh, cemeteries of the Palestinian destroyed villages. The cemetery of Lifta that we supposed to see it from this window, is totally destroyed. There are only two or three tombs that you can recognize, and the other tombs are totally destroyed. People are walking there and uh, hiking and biking and uh, um, doing picnic without noticing that they are walking on graves on a Palestinian cemetery. Lifta is one of 600 uh, locations. In one side, uh, it will teach us about the, the, the trauma and the destruction and the loss of the uh, Palestinian families that occurred in 1948 and what happened in their past, which is really sad and traumatic past, and they are still carrying this trauma till today. But on the other side, I'm, I'm inviting you just to look at these ruins as a, a witness not only for the past, but as a place for optional correction and redress in the future. Uh, the people of Lifta who are living as refugees for 73 years are still demanding their return or their rights on their property and their houses. And uh, uh, Lifta and the, uh, the views that we saw in the center of their village will maybe give us some directions how we can uh, make some justice uh, for the, these people in order to implement their rights and their uh, return and their uh, uh, ownership on their property um, with the consideration of the new situation that uh, happened in the last 73 years. Wow, well, thank you, Omar. Um, I've been to Lifta and in, in real life, and, and I really felt like I was there just now. Uh, thank you for doing that. Um, while we were in Lifta, we, one of our panelists joined us. Yuval, we're very happy to see you um, safe and um, joining us tonight. Do you want to just tell us a little bit about what's been going on the past couple of minutes or half hour? where you are, you're in Tel Aviv. Yuval Rahamim, for those of you who joined late, he's the Israeli co-director of the Parent Circle. He's a brief member. He's a past president of the organization. And uh, I'm very happy to see your face. Thank you, Cher. We just uh, spent the half past hour in the shelter. Uh, we had a shower of dozens of rockets coming from Gaza. Uh, unfortunately, there are also some casualties in the uh, Tel Aviv area. Uh, one rocket hit, hit the bus, uh, and some rockets hit uh, homes. I hope that no number is not so high, but uh, uh, yeah, it's very tense here. And there were several sirens, one after the other three had three, three uh, showers of rockets, uh, one by one after the other. Uh, earlier this evening, uh, the Islamic Jihad announced that they will at 9 p.m. Uh, bomb Tel Aviv, and this is what they, I mean, they were early a few minutes, but this is what uh, happened just now. Just now, and we are still not quite. I mean, <clears throat> uh, I believe there will be more during the night. 
we're very glad that you're you're safe and um if you need to go obviously we we understand yeah um before we get to to questions and answers and um and and take questions from the audience i want to i want to hear from naomi and asad um you know, part of the reason that we did this film, that we created this video in the first place was because um, when, when COVID hit, we, we wanted to continue our programming. We wanted to continue to be able to bring Israelis and Palestinians to different, through our programs, through our narrative program, taking them to Lifta, taking them to Yad Vashem, um, bringing them together into different activities. Um, and so one of the ways that we were able to, or we thought about doing that was through a video, um, a virtual tour of LIFTA. In the end, I think they used some other technologies, Google 360, to take participants to LIFTA. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I'm very proud that we were able to continue bringing Israelis and Palestinians, and we continue to do that despite COVID and despite the violence and, and I would say almost... Um, you know, because of the violence, it's even more important that we bring people together. And Naomi and Assad are two participants that both went to LIFTA in our narrative project. Um, Assad, I'm going to let you go first because you were in the first cohort, right? You were in the first group that went on our narrative project back in 2012. So tell us what that was like for you and what was your experience in LIFTA, um, please. And just unmute yourself. No, we can't hear you. You're on mute. There you go. Okay. Now we can hear uh, you. Good evening. My name is Asad. I'm a civil engineer. I live in Edna near Hebron. My experience with that Provide family was influence for my friend Saba, who <clears throat> invited me to meet Palestinian Israel uh, who lost one of them. At the beginning, it was hard. It is uh, not easy to hear or accept the idea. At the first time, at the first meeting, it was very hard to accept the people. At the second, more or less, uh, I think the connection between the people is kill the bad idea for the other side. Because all of the people I see in my life, only soldiers, they attack, they do bad things. I have bad memory for the Israel people. After the meeting, uh, I changed my idea. I changed my mind about for the Israeli people. After three months for the first meeting, I invite 15 Israeli people and 15 Palestinian people who list some of them to my home. And that's time when I invite them, my wife don't accept that. Don't accept it then. She said to me, you can stay with your friends. We, and I want to leave. I, I say to it, you can stay. No, I say, no, I want to leave. I, you can say to them, I want to go to wedding. I have wedding, I want to go to the wedding. I don't stay with them. I understand uh, what she took and what uh, the emotion inside it. It's not easy to accept people every time you see only the killer people for them. The attack, the boards. You see only the bad thing for the, Israel, uh, the face of the Israel people. And she lived up around four hours. We stay in the home. We do cooking together, Palestinian Israel people. I open the kitchen. And every, we work together, the Palestinian Israel people, we cook together, we eat. After four hours, my wife think the Jewish leave. When she turned back, some like surprise, something is 
uh, she is surprised about for what happened. It's not easy for it. But they come to her home. In our culture, anyone come to your home, you can accept him if you don't like him. She start to talk with them, uh, do coffee, some tea, some uh, juice, juice. Uh, they drink something. After one hour, when she meeting them, I say to them, I want to talk, to go uh, around the city, around my city. We go to with the cars, with Arab cars, not Israeli uh, cars. <clears throat> we go around the city. Uh, my wife at that time accepted one of the women. Her name is Ofra. I don't know something inside everyone. Uh, one of they like each other. They start to talk together. After they leaving, my wife said to me, "Are you sure they are Jewish?" I say yes. You not? I think they Christian, not Jewish. I said to her, no, Jewish, not Christian. <laughs> she said to me, "But they are some good people." In them. You say Ofra, I like that woman. Mm. I said it's okay. The first time you like somebody. Mm -hmm. For me, it's very good because I, the first time I don't accept any one of them. Mm -hmm. The second time I start to accept because the connection between people kill every bad memory inside the other. Mm -hmm. After years, after six months for, uh, for the second meeting, Ofra uh, invite the Palestinian uh, and the Israel <coughs> and, uh, and, uh, and the civil society mm -hmm. to her home. I get with me my wife. It's the first time she go to Israel because we don't enter to Israel because we don't have the uh, permission to enter to Israel. And uh, for it, it is not easy to enter to Israel because every time she see the bad thing, mm -hmm. she think if she go to Israel, they can mm -hmm. When she and uh, when she accepted to go with us, for me it's very nice. Very nice. Yes, I get it. After that, we uh, start uh, to be to talk uh, family to family. We go for many meetings. This is my accept. Uh, this is my experience for the abbreviated family, and mm -hmm. I am uh, thankful, Sama, Thank who you. pushed me to mm. be in that meeting. Yes. This is my experience uh, for the brief. About Thank for Lifta, about for Lifta when I did mm -hmm. Lifta. The memory turned back to the bad thing what happened for those people. 3,000 people stay in uh, palace houses. The houses in that area, you say that's palace, not any house. Mm -hmm. What you see in the film now. I see the people who can stay in the palace in this homes, this villa. Now we see in refugees camp. If you talk with him, what is the Israel? He don't he cannot accept it. Israel. He cannot accept it anyone who talk about with Israel people. Because he turned back to his home. For me it is not easy to see this home, all of the people stay out three months, three, uh, 3,000 people, they lost their home. Uh, it's a big bear for those people. For me, I am, I go to that area like journey and I get a lot of bear. What I say to those people who leave that home, thank you.
Well, let's say the last line again. What did you say at the end? We leave, we leave that behind. I see that uh, uh, for me, I get a lot of pain when I see the people, when I see that houses. Mm -hmm. What I can say to the people who leave that school. Mm, I understand. Okay. It's not easy. It's not easy. To, uh, to say to them, it is easy for you to uh, to accept the Israel people. Yes. And, yeah, and what you're talking about, Assad, what you're describing is so, so um, significant because you are talking about empathy, right? And that's so much of what we're trying to do is to generate empathy for the other and for for our own as well our own you know we're all we're all yes. humans but but we're trying to generate empathy and the other piece that you talked about with the story between your wife and Ofra is really about humanization right it's about bringing people together people are people Israelis and Palestinians and connecting them on a human level not as is enemies, but as as people who have who drive in cars together and who share a meal together, and that's um, also you know very representative of the narrative project and all of the work that we're trying to do. So thank you for sharing your experience with uh, with us, Assad. Um, Naomi, tell us about your experience. You participated in 2018, 2019, so. Um, much later in the lifespan of the narrative projects. Tell us about your experience um, in LIFTA and in the narrative project, please. Okay, hi, first I um, want to thank you for inviting me and for to all the participants, which is very touching to see that um, you're all here listening. Um, it's a lot of people and um, yeah, and it's it's a great support. So maybe it's a little bit an answer to some questions that were risen. What can we do from here and what is realistic? So know that this support um, of the family cycle and of the participants is truly um, a great, great uh, power. Um, yeah, I participated in the um, in the narrative project, which was an incredible um, experience for me. I grew up in Jerusalem. I was uh, born in 75, 1975, and I grew up uh, all my life in Jerusalem. And Lifta is located just in the entrance to Jerusalem, so it's very um, central, and we passed it so many times. I didn't know anything about it uh, growing up and um, although I, I was I did grow up in a kind of a left ideo ideology family my uncle was one of the founders of Shalom Akshav and um, so I wasn't I, I didn't feel that the narrative group uh, in any way changed my opinions or my attitude it did um, let me um, gave me the opportunity to um, to approach this conflict and to be in touch with all the um, difficulty that uh, that it was and all the the feelings of uh, of um, um, regret maybe shame guilt as like um, as an Israeli of what is going on. Um, but um, so as a child in my childhood, the Nakba was never, never spoken of. Um, the word was not unfamiliar to me. Um, and the one time that I was in Lifta as a youth, I, I, we came in a field trip. We were sitting there. I remember eating figs, uh, talking about nature and things like that, but never of the history of the place. So. It wasn't part of um, uh, my knowledge, and um, and uh, when so the first time we went to Lifta was uh, was when I learned about all this. Um, the Palestinian people came; uh, they journeyed from the middle of the night sometimes um, for many many hours. They had roadblocks to pass, etc. 
some of them arrived, some of them were denied uh, denied um, the certification to, to come to the trip at the last minute. Um, and they joined us with a telephone um, over the phone. But what struck me was um, um, their reaction, how they connected, how they felt. I was witnessing the Palestinian uh, people uh, kind of returning to to their homeland. They were speaking about feeling at home in Lifta and um, and uh, it was very, very emotional and exciting to see them. And I remember one of them, Ahmed, was jumping from roof to roof to the garden and um, he later shared some poems that he wrote about the love of the motherland and uh, um, it was very emotional, heartfelt um, experience. And I had a, I have an kind of an anecdote that happened to me there uh, that is, I feel a bit symbolic um, because we were walking and the Palestinians were picking, um, uh, for, kind of foraging, I think that's the word, uh, leaves of a plant uh, a lot. And they were saying, uh, Luf from Lifta, Luf is the name of the plant. And they were like, collecting a lot of Luf and they were like planning to bring it back home and, and and they were collecting it all the time. And I was wondering out loud, oh, um, how, how do you eat that? And somebody from the Israeli group um, was, was saying uninformed, um, yeah, you can eat it fresh or you can cook it. So I didn't in, uh, investigate further and I ate a leaf. And the uh, loof is a very uh, poisonous uh, plant if you eat it uh, uncooked. And um, I, I, the group continued and I was starting uh, uh, to feel the numbness in my mouth and it was starting to swollen, to be swollen and I got panicked. I called my brother, woke him up um, and told him, call the poison center and ask them what to do. They called me back and I was sitting there by myself with my phone and I got uh, uh, a call and he asked me, when did it happen? Is it going, growing worse or is it, um, is it a little bit better by now? And since it was getting a little bit less, um, he said, you're going to be fine. You probably don't have an allergic reaction. So if you are allergic to this plant, you, you, it's very, very dangerous. And the wow. symbolic part of this is um, that actually the Palestinians are the people of this land. You know, it's kind of my land as an Israeli, but it, it really isn't. It was very clear who was the squatter of the place and who really belonged there and knew the plant, uh, knew how to use it. Um, but the um, kind of optimistic point is that I since then learned from my Palestinian friends how to cook loof and I was collecting it in my uh, when I was living in Tel Aviv in my garden in Tel Aviv and the um, cooking it properly like about three hours until it's uh, losing the poisonous um, aspect and um, so yeah this is uh, one of the, the experience of Lifta. Very so it was good to hear uh, from Omar the, the, the story that I missed uh, partly because of this incident. Um, yeah, any questions you no, Thank you. Yeah, we'll get back to questions in a minute. I, there are some questions for Umar about Lifta, but um, Yuval, you've been a facilitator of the narrative project and you've, you've gone with groups to, and we're sort of, we're out of time, <clears throat> so people can leave if they have to, but there are still many, many people here and still many questions, so we're going to stay on a little bit longer. Um, Yuval, Tell us a little bit about uh, your experience as a facilitator of the narrative project and going to LIFTA and, and the group's sort of understanding and process processing of the Nakba um, and, and how that impacts the group. 
one of the one of the most amazing things about about the narrative is that uh, <clears throat> most of the participants on the Israeli side are the ones that well naturally open to these kind of experiences. The the one that hold uh, the ones that hold left wing opinions, but nevertheless, once you're confronted with the stories of the Palestinians and of the Nakba and Lifta, you, things that come up is that we are the result of the Israeli education system, as much as the Palestinians are the result. And no matter what your opinions are, your narrative, your inner, even um, emotional, um, uh, it, most inner narrative is, is shaped by years of being part of the Israeli society that is living according to these narratives. The ones that are that belong to the other side are, are so different that even if you are very open-minded and very left-wing, uh, there, there is a confrontation that you feel uh, between your identity that was shaped throughout the years and what you hear from your Palestinian partners on the, on the, on the seminar. And this is very hard. This is a very, very deep uh, experience and you must have a lot of strength to be able to hold both your narrative and identity and at the same time understand that maybe for the first time in your life that according that you are a fruit, a result of a system and that no matter how open you will try to be, you will remain uh, on, a, on, on one side. And we cannot, we cannot consider ourselves uh, objective or we are not the United Nations. We are Israelis. So I think the most important result of the narrative, Serena, is to understand that no matter uh, what we know, everything is uh, biased. Everything that we know, everything that we hear on the news, on the history books, on our society, on our meetings, is biased to one narrative. And when you understand that, and when you understand it on both sides, um, you become more compassionate to the other stories. You understand that the other stories are much uh, as good as your story. And uh, the visit in, in Lifta is so visual, it's so vivid, because you can really see with the Omar facilitation, you can really see the people on the houses, on the shops, on the, on the fountain, and you can see the lives that were, that were, that were there, the city life. And I believe that everybody that comes out of this seminar will never be the same. Thank you. Well, I think that's important for us to get perspective on and put it into context. Um, Uma, there's a couple of technical questions. I'm trying to consolidate. There are many questions in the chat in the Q&A box. First, there's a little bit of confusion as to where exactly Lifta is. Where is it in relation to Jerusalem? Where is it in relation to Palestine? Where is it? Where where is exactly Lifta situated? Yeah, thank you. Uh, if you if you let me share screen, I can also share yes. map maybe to show where is the location of Lifta. It is in the interest of Jerusalem today. Till 1948, it was an independent village, uh, five kilometers from the city, the center of the city of Jerusalem, uh, to the um, uh, west north direction, something like that. But today, it's uh, really in the uh, the, the, the most important entrance and the historical entrance of Jerusalem. And you can notice the houses behind in the picture behind me. Uh, if you are in the bus and you entering the city of Jerusalem two minutes before the central bus station of West Jerusalem. I, I made you the co-host, so you should be able to share your screen now if you want to. Ah, okay, thank you. Let, tell me if you see something. Yes, I see 1870 and a map. But now I don't you see, see it. Anymore. No, I don't oh, see it. Anymore. Now it is there, right? No, I don't see it. Soon now. it will be. Now, now. now it, yes. Okay, so this, this is an old map. This is the city of Jerusalem. And this is Lifta in the uh, little bit to the northwest 
of Jerusalem and this map from 1870. And this map will be from the 40s, 1943. This is the city of Jerusalem, which became bigger and the new neighborhoods around and uh, uh, Lifta will be over here. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Now I will stop sharing. Okay. And, and the other sort of big question that's been coming from a lot of people and uh, I'm curious what all of you have to say about this because it's come from a variety of, of people. We also have a, a, I think a Swedish parliamentarian joining us today who's, and also asking this question of what can we do? Like this, the tragedy continues. 1948 continues, Nakba continues, the violence is here. What can we do? We are not in Israel, we are not in Palestine. Um, how do, how do we be a part of the solution? Here's Yuval. Yuval, you missed the question, but I think I, I'm going to repeat it so that you can um, respond as well, because I think it'll be important. But, um, you know, I want to hear from everybody. The main question that's coming in through the Q&A box is, you know, what can we do? We are foreigners. We are not living in Israel. We are not living in Palestine. We see that the Nakba continues. We see the devastation. We see the violence. We are witnessing it all. We care deeply. What can we do? Uh, yeah, that's a very, yes. very, very complicated question. First, as an Amer as Americans, um, I think once one one thing to do is not take sides because taking sides immediately converts the other uh, to your enemy. And that will even, uh, in the, the pressure will be stronger on, on, on one side. And what I believe that uh, today, although there's no, there's no balance in power and no balance in anything, there's no symmetry in this conflict, yet there is one balance that exists. Both sides feel very threatened. Israelis feel threatened, although they are powerful and maybe much more than the Palestinians and Palestinians feel power, powerless and, and frightened and they are com constantly menaced by the occupation. So both sides feel that they are victims. And this is the only, the only way we will be able to even have some progress is for the sides to stop feel victims. And this is what we are doing in the narratives and others uh, and other uh, other uh, programs that we, educational program that we show each side the story of the other in the in the very in the very simple human human eyes. So you can really see your enemy not as an enemy but as a human being, and lowering the the fear, the the barriers between the two sides. This is what we do here. What you can do there is to support it, and even talk to your congressman or your I don't know what, not to push to one side, push the sides to get back to the negotiations table. This is only, the only solution here is to bring leaders of Israel and Palestine back into negotiation. We, we know it's very complicated, but this is the only way that this situation is going to be solved by negotiation and what the United States and other countries can do, uh, the, the role they can play is to guarantee the safety and the rights of both sides by, um, by moderating this negotiation, by facilitating, by providing the conditions for uh, and the guarantees for a stable, sustainable peace agreement. And as Americans and as other, other nations, what you can do is really support that. Whatever you do, you can write, you can participate in, in activities you can come visit Palestine and Israel once it's once it's possible to learn more about. It's very complicated. It's not easy to just you know see a movie or participate in a seminar and understand the situation. Most of us here do not understand fully the conflict. And you see that when we, as Israelis and Palestinians, participate in this kind of seminar, we learn so much that we didn't know in the past. So understanding is the first step, and understanding is the, the second. The, the second side is very, very important when you, are, when you are here. Most of us believe 
that we know the other side. And this is, of course, not true unless you just go there and talk to the other. Thanks, Yuval. Um, and Omar, I don't know if you want to add to that something, but also two yeah. really good questions came in just now that I want you also to address is about sort of the aftermath of the Nakba, right? So people are asking about, first of all, where did the majority of the Palestinians from Lifta go to? And how did the Palestinian people respond in general after, you know, after they were forced to flee? Did they immediately, was it immediately the Nakba? When did this term sort of come to be? Well, yeah, but remind me just to get back to the okay. uh, yeah. that question. Uh, um, the the majority of the people of Rifta, as I said in the beginning, they went to the area of Ramallah and they stayed there for a while. And when they found out that the the their refuge is taking longer than they thought and the return is not possible at that time, they just looked for places to, 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 to live and to stay, uh, still uh, uh, most of them found houses or rented houses in the area of Ramallah and the uh, refugee camp of Kalandia, which is also very close to Ramallah. And some of them uh, uh, in, in the, after the expulsion moved to their own uh, uh, private lands in East Jerusalem that was not occupied yet by, by Israel and they built houses there. Mm -hmm. And they are living till today, they are still living till today in a very beautiful neighborhood called the Lifta neighborhood in Jerusalem, very close to the Mount Scopus uh, area and the Hebrew University and the French Hill, this is the, uh, uh, which was by the way, or historical land of the people of Lifta. Uh, uh, and as I said in the in the video, and uh, during the time some of them moved out of Palestine and they live till today in Jordan in Amman, and some of them in 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 the Western uh, countries. The term Nakba uh, was actually used for the first time by a Lebanese historian, his name Constantine Zrek, who wrote a book in July 1948 called in Arabic, Ma'na Nakba, the meaning of the Nakba. And from that book, I think all the historians and the, uh, 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 the people use this term, but I was surprised during my research in this field to find a flyer that the Israeli army used also in 1948 when uh, in some places the Israeli uh, airplanes just threw flyers on the Palestinian villages in order to give them orders, leave now or uh, surround now or do something uh, according to the Israeli uh, side demands. And they use the term Nakba. If you will not do one, two, three, Nakba will happen to you. And they use that in, in very beautiful Arabic. Uh, but formally, all the historians today will uh, admit that Constantine Zrek, he was the first person who actually gave the, this term to this historical time uh, for the Palestinian people. Uh, back to the, uh, uh, to the question, what we can do, what you can, you can do, I, ju I just want to add my different point of view than uh, Yuval. I think we, we, we need, it is the time to, uh, uh, to shift our approach and our uh, 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 understanding of what's so-called the conflict now. It's, it's, I cannot, if, if we continue to go around this uh, um, circle of its two sides are fighting against each other on a piece of land and uh, uh, let's bring uh, both of them and impose them to talk and to make peace we tried that for decades and it didn't work. I think uh, 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 the shift should be to understand from the beginning that the, 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 the real conflict is not only 1967, it's not the West Bank occupation. It started from the Nakba and the ethnic cleansing of the Palestinian people. If you will not start there, nothing will, will, not, will reach almost nothing. The other thing is to uh, uh, to see that the responsibility 
as you said, it's not symmetric situation. So the responsibility on the uh, Israeli side and the international community can do, can make some steps of pressure, of sanctions, as they did in South Africa for many years. And it, it, it gave fruits. I think the, if, if we look at the situation over here in Palestine and the relationship between the Israeli side and the Palestinian side is kind of colonization and the solution should be decolonization, we will reach, uh, I think, better, uh, better uh, suggestions or plans for better future than to look for uh, two-state solution and uh, uh, to decide what is the border between between them. I think the problem is not there. We talk about it because there is a light on it, but it's not there. The problem is something uh, else, and that 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 something is is dark, and we should enlighten it and open our minds to say it started 1948. Let's start from there and find the solution according to that. I personally believe on one state solution. I don't see that two state solution will bring peace. It could bring agreement, some kind of agreement for a while, but the, the solution should be equal people in equal landscape. And uh, we can say one person, one vote in the whole uh, area that we uh, uh, live in the, the at least the what so called the Palestine under the, 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 the British mandate that uh, became the state of Israel and the West Bank and Gaza. I think it should be one political unit. Right. I think Omar, that I mean, that could be a whole other webinar, right? I think at the parent circle, what's important for us is that um, we're not a political organization. And so we understand and acknowledge that there are many, many ways of getting to peace, whether it's one state or two states or 50 states or whatever it may be. That's not for the parent circle to decide. Mm -hmm. Um, at the parent circle, we're doing work on the people to people level, right? We're bringing people together and whatever decision is made, we want it to be made through respect, through understanding of the other side, through listening to each other, through empathy and from seeing each other as human. So I, you know, you have a very, very valid, uh, valid uh, opinion, um, many, much of which you, many members of the parent circle would agree. And yet, our mission doesn't go into those, those details. Um, and I think that it's important for, for our members as bereaved individuals who have uh, respect in both societies to, um, you know, to stay on that human level of the conflict. And I think with that, we have to say goodbye because we're already way over our time. Um, I want to say thank you to our incredible panelists that were here today during such difficult times. Um, you know, I, I felt stressed here in Seattle, Washington, so I can't even imagine what it was like for you, although sometimes being further away is, is harder. Um, so thank you all. This will, this has been recorded. We will send out the recording to everybody who was here today. A lot of people wanted to know if the video would be made available. We will look into that, and if so, we will send it to you. Um, I encourage you all to come to LIFTA and to meet with Umar and have you take him uh, in person to LIFTA um, and to learn more about our narrative project. So thank you all for, for joining us here today and everybody be well and be safe. Thank, thank you very much. much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Good night.